So I'm gonna to try to follow up Boris, and for those of you who have seen him speak before and have seen me speak before, know that that's a hard thing to do. He's an incredible speaker, he has set the stage for you, and now I get to put you to sleep. No, I'm just kidding, I'm gonna try and keep you awake and, and shape and frame and share with you some of the problem that we have been dealing with. Um, I will tell you a story following up on the, he did tell us and tell folks around us, if you see the group running down the hall, that's when something bad happens. Well, there was one occasion in which we all heard a big boom, very loud boom, very scary boom, and we ran down the hall, down the stairs, Matt. Turns out a goose had flown into the power lines right outside of our office. <laughs> um, fortunately, the goose was the only casualty and we return to work and to continue to safeguard the nation's public health. And we still try to do that. As you mentioned, I am a nurse and I always look at this from the ultimate nursing role for me, which is patient advocate, in this case, the public advocate. And so as we, as I've worked in this space of medical countermeasure development for chemical, biological, radiological, nuclear threats, and emerging infectious diseases, which have been most of what we've been dealing with. Um, I always look at it from the perspective of that recipient receiving the product, and are we doing the right thing to ensure that that person either doesn't become ill or we get them back to health as quickly as possible. Um, the ultimate goal is to mitigate human suffering, mitigate health consequences, save lives. So this slide right here, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it, but it's just to illustrate, if you look to the 2017 side of the slide where we are now, you'll notice that it's much, much heavier populated in terms of the types of public health threats that we are either responding to, we're still responding to Ebola, we're still responding to Zika, and threats that we've been monitoring that have been hovering out there that we're concerned about, like MERS-CoV, um, high uh, pathogenic avian influenza, the most recent potential influenza problem for us is H7 and 9, and there is a lot of work going on. And I'll talk a little bit about how we all come together and do that work. But I think it's fair to say that ever since 2001 and the anthrax attacks, there has an ever-increasing pace and tempo of potential threats. And we're not here to talk about why that is, other than to perhaps acknowledge that just by looking at this slide, we know that it's ever-increasing. And I don't think it's going to reduce. I think as things go forward, we are going to be dealing with more and more potential threats. So we've done a lot of work over the last 15 years since the anthrax attacks in the field of medical countermeasures and particularly putting together a comprehensive framework, working together all the stakeholders in this area. Many of you have been in this space and have a piece of it so you know what I'm talking about of rapidly identifying what are the countermeasures that we need for these types of threats? How do we develop them? Let's get them developed. Let's get them down the product life cycle. Let's get them into the stockpile. Let's get them deployed. And we've even figured out most recently, started to figure out how do we do advanced product development in the midst of responding to a public health threat. And we're seeing that with both, uh, we saw it with Ebola and Zika most recently. So there's a lot that we've learned. But we've also recognized that while there has been a lot of work toward figuring out how we're going to develop the products, how we're going to use the products, how we're gonna deploy them, how we're gonna make sure that folks have them when they need them, we've not put that much emphasis yet on what we've been calling in a small group of us um, within the federal government that have been thinking about this over the last two years as beyond the last mile. So those of you might have heard that the dispensing and distribution is considered the last mile of that um, life cycle. So we're, we're here to think about beyond that last mile. And it's not to say that there aren't mechanism as, mechanisms and that there aren't tools and capabilities and ways that we can monitor countermeasures. We have tools. We've been monitoring medical products for a very long time. 
The problem is the capacity is limited because it hasn't been designed and it hasn't been the, the purpose for those tools in many ways it was not for rapidly collecting, analyzing, aggregating data in the midst of public health emergencies and then rapidly using that information to either inform the use of that product, continued use of the product in that same emergency or for preparedness for future emergencies. And so that's where we've run into a little bit of a limitation and that's the piece that we're here today to work on and think through novel solutions um, of how we can do this and do this better. Um, the, the way I look at it is we're talking about the interface from patient countermeasure forward. Somebody has taken the countermeasure, somebody has been administered the countermeasure, how are we going to assess performance of that countermeasure? And I'm also going to ask you to think about if the countermeasure were to fail and not perform as we expect it, or if the countermeasure is causing side effects or adverse events that we didn't anticipate. I want you to think about where is that individual going to go? What is that individual going to do? Where might the information about that MCM performance be captured? And how then can we access that information rapidly without disrupting a response? Where the information is already being captured and how might we be able to utilize it? So I'm also going to try and give an MCM 101, and I, 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 kn I know many, many of you have been working in this space for a long time. A lot of this is going to be very high level, very uh, far above where you are um, with your areas of expertise. But I do want to acknowledge that we might have some participants who might be new to thinking about MCMs in the way we do, so I'm going to go over a little bit of an overview. And it's not comprehensive, it's meant to just put out there the key things that we need to consider so that that can be used to spur discussion. So if there's any need for clarification or more detail, you have amongst yourselves participants that are experts within FDA, within NIH, within the different federal government um, agencies that are involved. They're, from what I understand, pharmaceutical um, partners here registered, and we also have health IT folks that have registered. So we're hoping to bring together not just the traditional countermeasure expertise, but bring others into the dialogue with us to start thinking through these solutions. So FDA's role, and, and this is an FDA-sponsored workshop, so, so I just want to make sure that we understand why FDA is doing this. Our role is to facilitate the development and access to medical countermeasures. Um, medical countermeasures pose special challenges, and I'll talk about those in a minute, of why this is so difficult and why we're here to try and figure it out. Um, but we do have mechanisms and tools in our legal and regulatory toolbox that we can use as we assess these countermeasures to either have them continue down the development pipeline, accelerate their path down that pipeline, or mechanisms by which we can approve the countermeasures and put them in the stockpile for use if we ever need them. And mind you, some of these countermeasures will not be used and will not be exposed to the affected population until something actually happens. And we're relying on these countermeasures to save those lives. Um, some of the legal mechanisms that we have, most of you are probably familiar with, the emergency use authorization, the investigational new drug application. We could use our investigational device exemption authorities, expanded access. We have tools in our toolbox, and we have used them in a variety of ways. And we know that we will need to rely on all of the mechanisms, including relying on products that are already out there on the market, um, when we have to respond to a public health emergency. FDA also ensures consumer protection. Something that we do that's very invisible to the public a lot of times is pulling fraudulent products off the market. And I can tell you, working in this space, there are a lot of bad people out there who want to make a quick buck, who will take advantage of a public health emergency and the fear that people have, anybody recall fear bola? To put stuff out there on the market and try and make a quick buck. This diagnostic, this 
supplement, this will cure Ebola, this will prevent you from getting Ebola. So there's a big role that FDA plays in protecting the consumer and identifying those and pulling them off the market so that the legitimate countermeasures um, can be put out there and used. And for me, as, as a patient advocate, something that I've been very passionate about my entire career, which is the monitoring of the performance of the medical countermeasures, monitoring once these countermeasures are used and they get into the individuals, how are we going to assess and make sure that they're performing the way that we expect and that they're not co causing more harm. And even if they're not causing harm, we need to know if they're not doing anything at all. So this is a slide I use a lot. It's the traditional medical product life cycle. And I only put it up there to contrast against the challenges that we face with medical countermeasures. Most of you who are working in the development space understand this and have seen this many different times. Um, for those of you, the quick down and dirty is that there is a very carefully um, controlled, very iterative process and pathway by which medical products go from discovery all the way to market. And each preceding phase of that life cycle informs the next phase on whether the countermeasure goes forward and whether the countermeasure goes out and whether the countermeasure goes on the market. And even after a countermeasure is approved in the uh, what we call the phase four post-marketing stage, there is still surveillance of the countermeasure. And we have tools for that. We have passive surveillance systems active surveillance systems in place. There's voluntary reporting. There's mandatory reporting. So we do monitor medical products. But as I said before, most of the capabilities and capacities that we use for monitoring medical products were not designed for use specifically in public health emergencies. So while we rely on those systems, we are limited and we don't have a comprehensive strategy or framework or comprehensive capability that we put into play in the midst of a public health emergency. Um, the other piece of this slide that I like to point out is that normally products go all the way down that pathway and then they're approved for market for wider spread use. In public health emergencies, particularly the most recent ones, we have been faced with deliberating and making decisions about making products available as part of the response that are farther left, closer to that pre-IND and discovery phase than we ever have before. Um, at one point, we were even deliberating, uh, we were asked to opine on a countermeasure to be used for MERS-CoV abroad, and the particular countermeasure had no human data at that point. So more and more, we're seeing that line of where you might think something would go out the door pushed farther and farther to the left. So what we normally do in a very controlled, in a very iterative process, in a pre-market setting, we're faced with having to figure out how to do it in more of a post-market setting when the product is being made available. In some cases, if it's a mass casualty event, widely available, and that's when we're having to collect the information. For medical countermeasures, the, the, the challenges to this particular um, pathway are that we don't always have the affected population. They're only going to be available during the public health emergency, which means we're taking products down the pathway, but we cannot always do all the types of human trials that we would normally do to generate the type of information that would inform their approval and use. Um, in some cases, for some of these threats, we have products that we've approved under what most of you have heard, the, the animal efficacy rule. So at the time the product would go out the door and be used to save a life, and we're depending on it to save the life, it's the first time that we're going to actually be able to get data in the affected population when we're depending on that product to work. It's a really difficult time if we can't assess if the product is working or if we can't assess well if the product is working. There are also other challenges. There are post-marketing commitments or requirements that usually accompany an approved product that goes to market. In a public health emergency, it becomes extremely difficult 
to conduct the type of studies or collect the kind of information needed to meet these post-marketing commitments, which are designed to tell us how well the product is, is performing. And of course, for these threats, in some cases, there are no available medical countermeasures. So we're really having to look at what's in the pipeline, how can we move it forward, and how fast and how early can we get this out. The partners that have been in this space um, do this extremely well. Um, there are a lot of decisions that are made on limited data, but it is very carefully considered sound scientific data. At no point are we putting products out there that we, we, we have doubts about their use. We, have, we believe the products are going to perform in the way that we're expecting based on the information that we have, but the truth is sometimes we have limited information and we need to get the information to complete that safety and efficacy database during the public health emergency. Um, I usually put this slide here to, to, to kind of illustrate. There's the traditional pathway that I talked about. There's the challenges with MCMs. And then there's the public health emergency. And the big takeaway from this is that the intent in a public health emergency is to mitigate and respond. So that's why we're looking at how do we respond, how do we mitigate, very quickly ma making those decisions. And it's always unplanned and unexpected. Even the ones that we are monitoring, that we know about, that we are preparing for, we don't know when they're going to happen. We don't know where they're going to happen. We don't know how severe they're going to happen. We just know that they might happen somewhere at some point, and we need to be able to respond to those. During a public health emergency, you'll have simultaneous administration of multiple products under multiple regulatory mechanisms versus traditional R&D where you're looking at a single product in a very controlled setting. You're looking at it in specific populations versus the entire population at once. In a public health emergency, it's rapid, rapid decision making. It's little or no tracking or monitoring because we haven't planned for that because the purpose is to respond, not necessarily to collect data, though we're here because we have to collect data and we need to be thinking in those terms. There's, in some cases, for the mass casualty um, concept of operations, there's lack of a primary provider or lack of interaction. You're going to a pod to receive antibiotics from a responder, a first responder. You're going to a mass vaccination site. You're not going to your doctor who knows, in many cases, you're not going to be going to your doctor, who knows your medical history, who can look at your medical record, who can look at all the information, and based on all of that, make a, uh, a recommendation and, and provide a judgment on what should be done in your particular case. That may not happen during a public health emergency, and the countermeasures are being broadly used across um, the population uh, at risk. So there is a cycle that we have. It's, goes from preparedness all the way to response. And I'm not going to walk through the details of the slide. A lot of you work in this space. You have either different pieces of that cycle or you're focused on one part of that cycle. Um, but at every given point during that cycle, FDA's role is to take the scientific data, the public health needs, and the regulatory frameworks and make those risk-benefit assessments with regard to does the product continue down the pathway? Does the product continue to be developed? Do we put it into more people? Do we take it to the next phase? Do we allow that? In the case of a public health emergency, do we authorize emergency use of that product? And if we authorize emergency use of that product, under what regulatory mechanism? If there are products that are already out there on the market and they're being used off-label, how do we provide information about that? How do we get information about that use? And so once we're in the response mode, there still needs to be that data collection to inform, and that's what we're talking about right now, where we have the most limitations and the most difficulty for, for collecting that information. So I'm going to walk you through H1 and 1. I know it's been a while since 2009, but believe it or not, we're still struggling with monitoring and assessment conundrums stemming from our H1N1 experience. And I also want to use this to illustrate how the timelines are compressed, compressed and how the different government partners work together. Now, that's not to say we don't work together in, in development and availability of products during all phases or for any other type of product development. But when it comes to the response in an emergency, that dynamic, that tempo, that level of engagement changes somewhat. 
where we might have waited for final study reports to come into FDA during a public health response, we are in communication constantly as the data is being generated and deliberating over that information because we have to make decisions rapidly. Um, they still follow the, the normal pathways, but a lot of times the timelines are compressed. So for H1N1, within four months, April 2009 when we had the first cases, to September of 2009, four months between identifying cases, CDC starting to work on a candidate um, vaccine, um, the SNS releasing countermeasures because public health emergencies had been declared by both the WHO and by the US. We were already planning for vaccine distribution of this new vaccine. We were deliberating under what regulatory mechanism. Fortunately for H1N1, the vaccine was handled as a strain change, so very similar to the way we do seasonal influenza vaccine. The manufacturing process is established. We know um, how we're going to do this. We're just handling a strain change. But there were differences with H1N1 that required us to do clinical trials um, to bridge some of the information. And that's not normally done in a seasonal strain change. So we were doing something slightly differently in and in compressed timeframes than what you normally would do if you're having to do clinical trials for a vaccine. But the big um, point I want to make is by October 2009, five months in, FDA had issued many emergency use authorizations, both for products that were already on the market, um, where we were authorizing um, unapproved uses of those products based on data that we had that supported those uses. And we had issued by October the very first emergency use authorization of what I consider a truly investigational product, meaning Paramavir had never been approved in the United States, had never been approved abroad, was still in that development phase when FDA issued the emergency use authorization for it to be more widely available during the um, response. That was a good thing. That was a very good use of our authority. In retrospect, we were not prepared to monitor and assess the performance of Paramavir and other products um, that are out there being used, but Paramavir being the primary example. When we go back even now and retrospectively look at the information, we cannot make heads or tails of whether the product really worked, really helped, really hindered, or did nothing at all. And so Paramavir is the hallmark example of where we don't want to be. And I think at this stage here in 2017, we're farther ahead in how we think about monitoring and assessing countermeasures and using our capabilities, but we're still not there yet. And I would argue that if we had to do the same thing again and another product at that level goes out on the market or goes out under um, emergency use authorization or Paramavir is now an approved product for a slightly different indication, if it were being used in an unapproved way, we have no really good way of assessing that performance and we really need to know that information. So as Boris mentioned, there's four big areas that we've been looking at. There's a group that's been working for the last two years um, called the Monitoring and Assessment Integrated um, Program Team. And we've looked at the current concept of operations. We looked at current capabilities. We looked at the way products are done, how we've monitored and assessed in public health emergencies. And we've come up with four big bucket areas of opportunity. There's the operations for response. And while we don't want to hash and rehash the distribution, the spending, there are still things to be worked out with that. That's not the focus, but to the extent that you have to talk about dispensing and distribution in order to inform the conversation about countermeasure performance and assessing it, that's the context in which we want to talk about operations for response. There's electronic health data. There are capabilities now. And as I mentioned earlier, if a countermeasure is failing and you go into the healthcare system to be treated, the information about you and about that countermeasure use will very likely be captured in electronic health data. So how could we extract the information we need from the electronic health data without disrupting the response or disrupting the clinical care, particularly if we're in a mass casualty event and you're really trying to just take care of patients and save lives? There's unstructured big data 
and there's clinical networks. Clinical networks is the one I think we're most familiar with because this is how we develop products. There are many clinical trial networks throughout the United States that do wonderful work. The question is, how might we link different sites across the different um, specialty areas for those clinical trial networks and regions and populations to gather critical information for um, the use of a countermeasure during the public health response. Most of the clinical trial networks that I've had familiarity with are either specifically looking at a type of threat or a type of um, health issue, cardiology, infectious diseases, pediatrics, HIV AIDS. So the clinical trial network is somewhat focused or they're in specific regions or specific institutions or specific population. So how might we be able to tap into the different ones to rapidly either pre-position protocols or push out a, a protocol that's designed for collecting um, specific data during the public health emergency, and how do we do that quickly? There's a lot of progress to date, a lot of things that have been done, and I'm getting the yellow light, so I'm gonna wrap this up really quick. There's a lot of progress that's been done. I'm not gonna talk about all of these, but many of these are FDA initiatives. Many of these are the Public Health Emergency Medical Countermeasure Enterprise initiatives. Some of them are Department of Defense initiatives. And all of these things are things that we are looking at. They are existing, they are underway, they are in development. We're not looking to create something new. We're looking to utilize the existing capabilities and the new things underway to figure out how to build in the public health emergency medical countermeasure assessment component to those. We can look at ER, electronic health record capability. We can look at handheld capabilities. We can link clinical trial networks. We can look at machine learning, social media, crowdsourcing, smart technology. How might we be able to use these so that we are not in the same situation we were before with H1N1? And how can we make sure we're collecting the information to know that the products are doing what we expect them to do? We all wear different hats. We all have a different piece of the puzzle. As Boris said, there's, th this has been designed for dialogue, discussion, and engagement. So I would encourage you to ask questions. We have a lot of expertise in the room, so leverage each other. Get the clarifying information to then have the dialogue to think about solutions and think about ways that we can do medical countermeasure monitoring and assessment going forward. So with that, I will turn it back over to Boris and to you guys for questions, discussion, dialogue. Great, uh, thank you so much, Carmen. And we're actually gonna...